All right, if you have a Bible, turn to Exodus 32. We're going to be way back in Exodus. I want to give a thanks to all of you that helped us kind of get settled these la- this last week or so and uh, helping me move stuff out of the trailer and into the office, and thank you very much. Uh, our house closes in Phoenix on uh, September 29, and so Sarah will be flying out on the 30th, so she'll be here with us in just a few weeks, which would be great, and um, so thank you for all the uh, kindness through that process. Uh, We're just in a brief three-week series on praying forward as we're looking ahead, new school year, uh, as well as new season of the church and how we pray ourselves forward through that. Also, we are um, in two weeks starting an eight-week series through Titus, and it's going to be, it's called uh, Message Received. Paul was writing to uh, Titus, who was a pastor on a small island and it was a rough crowd, that island was, and he gave instructions, and how do you live, how do you function, and if there's any time that we are living amongst an odd crowd of people in America, it would be today. And how is it you're to function? How do we interact with society? And uh, we're going to see that in eight weeks through Titus, uh, starting in just a couple weeks. But right now, it's Exodus 32. And the subject is, how do we act, how do we pray for those that are absolutely against us? Whether it's your family, somebody that's hurt you, yeah, even back so far as hurt you as a child. We're living in a a time where the extremes are just intense. We know that politically. And there are those that are literally doing things square just perfect against God, Christianity, and the Bible. That's happening, right? I mean, they couldn't be any better at that. They're like a great example of accomplishing something because it's bad. It's hurtful to families. Absolutely hurtful, demeaning to the cause of Christ. How do we interact with that? How do we treat that? So the text is Exodus 32, and it's this great phrase where God has said, and we'll read it all in just a moment, where God said to Moses, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may consume them. He was so upset with his people that he gets Moses aside and he goes, hold me back. I'm going to just consume all of them. They are absolutely, totally all against me right now. This is a very unusual passage where God is setting Moses up to intervene. I mean, theoretically, Moses could say, all right, you're God and annihilate them. But the role that Moses chose to take is the role that we want to think through with family members that are working against you, business partners that are working against you, politicians, those who have hurt you in your past. And Heavenly Father, we're asking that if your Holy Spirit would teach us, show us, from your word, prayer that is honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Exodus 32. So if you have your Bible there, look at the flow of this. It says, when the people saw, verse 1, that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. So he goes up onto the Mount Mount Sinai. It's 40 days he's gone. There's been a delay. So the people gathered themselves together to Aaron. Now we're talking siblings. You have Moses, the youngest. Three years older is Aaron. Another three years older is Miriam. So Aaron's a brother. And they go to Aaron and they say, Up, 
Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said, okay, take off rings of gold and ears, those in the ears of the wives, your sons and daughters, and bring them to me. So that all people took off the rings of gold, were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with gravings, graving tool, and made a golden calf and said, these are your gods. This is Aaron talking. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, this is like getting worse. At least you'd have the honesty to be against God. Actually going to include him now and says, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, proper name for God. So they rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down, ate, drank, and they rose up to play. They literally turned completely against God. We have it going on today. I, my heart goes out for that young person struggling with sexuality. And you and I, if there's anyone in the world that needs to throw their arms around them and say, we love you, it's us. And it's become, though, an agenda where we have to acknowledge and say things that are completely against what the Scriptures say. Many of us, if you're into social media things, follow Jordan Peterson, psychologist in Canada, because of Canada being further along than America is in many of these issues. You see what he's going through. It's just what we're about to go through. We're going to be silenced. This pulpit's going to, it's going to be an attempt to silence it. But we have to graciously and lovingly proclaim man and woman. It's man and woman. And for the one that's struggling, I want to throw my arms around and say, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, This this is what it is, and let's walk together. Let's introduce you into Jesus Christ, and then you guys work it out, and I'll help you. But there's things that we're not going to say and things that we're not going to agree to. But then you go even to the further extremes, and and all sides have those extremes, and you have this far extreme that we're watching on television and we're watching things that's being said and done, and they're literally ruining America and the family. Society is built upon a healthy family, and they're absolutely against the family. And I'm going to go on the record and say, I get pretty angry. That's the story here. The story is, they turned against God and His ways. So what do we do? Where do we go from there? A family member or family friend that hurt you as a child. The anger. No, I, I get it. it. It's all fair game, and it's, it's okay, because God's showing anger in this text. He was furious. The question is, what do we do? Where do we go from here? So when you look at this passage, those first six verses, we have to pause and say, who is there in your life that you're pretty angry at? It's better if it's even for good reason. It's like it wasn't fair what that parent did or spouse or family member or coworker. It wasn't fair. You've dealt with it the best you can, but you're you're angry. So where does it go? Look at the next verse. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down to your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. 
They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I've commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf, and they've worshipped it. They sacrificed to it and said, These are the gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So here it is. This is, the, this is the conversation. And he summarizes. I like it when the text of the Bible rehearses the same things. So it's emphasis. It's telling you, we just heard what they did. We just heard the text. They gathered together all the gold, and they made a golden calf, and they worshipped it, and Aaron led the way because the people asked him to. And then God pulls Moses and says, okay, let me tell you what's going on down there and rehearses the story and then says, hold me back. I'm going to consume them. This is where we are. We have a political system today that is at great odds and it's producing some anger. Oh, and I get it. Righteous anger. Okay, I'm I'm hearing you, but what do we do? What do we do about this? This passage is quite remarkable. In fact, I'll give a little humor in the passage. How about a little humor in this passage? What's funny about this passage, and I have it highlighted, that he says in verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought out of Egypt. That's that's God talking to Moses. Go down for your people who you brought up out of Egypt. But look at verse 11. But Moses responds to the Lord and says, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? Nobody wants to claim them. Moses is like, okay, these are your folks. This is your crowd. You brought them out of Egypt. Moses says, okay, I'm hearing you. Oh, I hear what you're saying about your people whom you brought out of Egypt. Like, I don't want them either. This is a rough crowd. This is an awkward conversation that the two of them are having. What do they do? Where do you go from here? Because the world says, literally would say, love people who deserve it. Christianity says, love everybody. Love and forgive everybody. Anybody can love people who deserve it. I don't know what year it was, maybe early 90s that Anton LaVey passed away. Anton LaVey, known as the Saint Paul of Satanism, he founded the Church of Satan. One of his statements One of his statements was actually, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. We would have thought, I would have thought, that Satan represents hatred and anger to everybody. But LaVey in his international church actually saying, oh no, be kind to your family when they deserve it. Be kind to a co-worker, absolutely. But the moment they don't deserve it, stop. Do you see what they're doing? That is actually a beautiful example of the opposite. So it's favoritism. So you and I will come here on a Sunday and I have a no problem we all loving on each other. This is a great crowd. But when you get somebody who is completely opposite politically or completely anti-Christian, there ought to be, and we know this, there ought to be a love expressed to them exactly equal to the love that is expressed in here. So we have like this 
uh, this line, and you go way out to the left. Way out to the left would be those that are the easiest to love. And that's uh, family sometimes. They come and go. They move on the line a little bit, family does. But generally, for the sake of argument, we'll say family. And then certain people, but then we've had people turn on us, right? What do they say? The one that you've helped the most is the one that ends up... Okay, so there, and then it's the neutral, it's the stranger in line, I could be nice to him, whatever. But then you have over here. Over here, the far right, this is where we say, wait a second, these are ones that are very difficult to love. That's what we're called to. Obscure passage, we may say. It's Exodus 32. So we could look at Christ when he literally on the cross says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is the same intervention. Here is the point. We can forget everything else. It's the intervention to recognize we're dealing with people who either can't pray or don't pray. They're people who are so far from God and they may not even know it. Somebody has to step up and intercede for them. So Jesus looking out at this hateful crowd. How in the world does he look at the crowd, not in anger, well, wait and see what you're going to get. You're ruining things. He looks out, looks to the Father and says, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. It's Moses who literally stands up to God and says, well, okay, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. We have one person standing, which is likely a million people, men, women, Israelites, non-Israelites, all the livestock. We have one person who stood up in between and went, okay, no, wait a second. No, you can't. Protect them. You have to protect them. You got to save them. There's our role. And too often I'm finding myself at the, I'm just as obnoxious on the other side. Right? In the political system. We're not playing the same game. We're not playing by the same rules. It's not the one who yells and has the best points that win. We love. There's a phrase that I was telling somebody this week. There's a, there a pretty large meeting, a hundred of us with um, Mark. I think it was us talking about Bruce Wilkinson. Uh, who did uh, Walk Through the Bible and Pray Jabez and stuff. Uh, a lot of people don't. Well, we wouldn't know. He's from the same group that we are, um, CBA, Conservative Baptist, which is now Venture. That's where um, uh, Bruce Wilkinson is out of. So he's like one of us. And it was a conference of about 100 uh, pastors. And he's a pretty cool guy. And he, he just made a point very simply he goes, hey, just, uh, just on my observation, having traveled the world, met with pastors groups all over the world of all different kinds, he goes, here's just the deal. This is how it, uh, this is how it goes. The more conservative you are theologically, the more judgmental and the more lack of grace you have. There were several in the crowd that kind of got mad at that. And he goes, pfft. He goes, thanks for making my point. And we all just sat there. The more conservative you are, the more judgmental and the lack, the, you have the most lack of grace. I remember a church service just a few years ago. Um, I think there were three back-to-back, -back, and it was a good-sized crowd. Didn't, wasn't able to make my way around too much, but 
Towards the back was a very good friend of mine sitting there with his wife, and they brought a friend. Well, the friend was clearly, visibly clearly, a guy dressed as a woman. And I saw my buddy, and I just said hi to him. Hey, good evening, Merry Christmas, good to see you. And then I glanced, and you could just see in the face the fear of what I'm going to do. And it was only because, probably because it was Christmas, I'll be honest, that I saw those two in the morning, and they said, let me introduce you to, and I don't remember her name. And uh, I said, oh, my name's Pastor Rob, and threw my arms around her, gave her a hug, and said, can't tell you how glad I am that you're here, and walked away. And I'll be honest, I I was kind of proud of myself. Because there's a shock value, right? That's what, I mean, it's it's not that I'm judging, it's just there's a shock value that I want to play shock value. If we're to convey anything, we have to convey love. Then the more conservative theologically we are, you want so bad to follow that statement with, but stand for the truth. Which you might have just done. Don't be guilty of loving too much. Yeah, but the word said, uh, I hear you. Let me tell you what God's not going to say when we get to heaven and I wish that he would. I wish that he would look at me and say, oh, hey, Pastor Rob, hey, good, good to have you. Uh, you. You loved a little too much. You kind of overdid it with the love. Kind of wanted you to be a little more judgmental. He's not going to say it. So it's the role in our mind to say, I want to step in and intercede. Because this person that was sitting with my friend is an adult, by 40s, and is very confused. Like, I, I don't know about anyone else, but, but this person didn't want that. They're confused. So where do you go when you're confused about life? Go to a group of believers. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That's going to make it worse. Because we just want to point out what's wrong. So we want to jump on the side of God and say, annihilate them. Just wipe them out. They're ruining America. Just wipe out whatever group that is that you think of or whatever person, we want to annihilate that. But it's pretty remarkable. It's a great word, verse 11, but Moses, but Moses implored, he implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out? to kill them in the mountains and consume them in the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and relent from the disaster against your people. I can't even imagine saying that sentence to God. He is literally saying, change your mind. That's relent or repent. Turn around from what you're going to do, do something else. He actually said that to God. That verse is unbelievable. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring and all the land that I've promised. Do you see what he's doing? He's appealing to the character of God. He's appealing to precedent. 
you're a God of love. You wouldn't do that. You promised this people land. Your reputation is going to be tarnished. He's actually literally arguing with God to get God to change his mind. That verse 12 again, turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. And then verse 14, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing to his people. You want to do theological cartwheels? The greats have struggled with those verses. Balancing with the unchangeableness of God, the immutability, that God doesn't change. He was going to do something. Moses actually stood up in defense of those horrible people with the only funny part of not claiming them. Okay, your people, you can't do this. And God said, okay, this is incredible. Could you imagine if not as some formal, organized sign-up sheet, but can you imagine if God's people in America stood up? Normally we'll say, yeah, against the immorality of America with God and said, they don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. I don't want any of them to die. I don't want one of them to die. Because according to our theology, if you die without Jesus Christ, you're in an eternity without God. I don't want one of them to die. It's not how we play, though, today. I remember only because I'm conservative, I remember hearing groups of people literally like it was a party when Rush Limbaugh died. So I'm watching it on TV. They were so happy. And my immediate response was, that's disgusting, and it still is. Yeah, but I've seen my camp when somebody on that side passes. They dis we disguise it maybe better, but like, oh, finally. Right? I, well, but, but they're ruining America. I, I know. Well, I, they didn't build a golden calf. <laughs> I mean, this is literally misleading all of them with pure idolatry pure. And yes, God was furious, but yes, Moses stood up and he intervened. And he goes, no, please don't. And he said, okay. Could you imagine? And that's my prayer for myself. I, I don't want to be judgmental. I want to be gracious and loving. Inside here, oh, don't misinterpret it. <laughs> don't misinterpret that. I'm a Liberty University graduate, part of the moral majority. Or as Falwell used to say, he, he always referred to us as Jerry's kids. That's, that's where I am. That's, that's who I am. But the more we are that way, the more compassionate and loving. And who is there that you in prayer could stand up and pray for knowing they're not praying for themselves? You're doing it for your kids, aren't you? Your grandkids? We do it for family. We become the ones praying because they're not. And so they're making it through because grandma's praying. Extend it. No favoritism. 
How is it that we can extend that? And I want, I don't want to fake it. I want to be able to see on the news something that is so damaging to America and it's being held up as the right thing. And I want my response to be one of compassion. And I'm not there. My first response is judgment. Don't want them in office. No, I don't. (laughs) I still don't. I want that to end. Yes, I do. But that's a person. I want them to see him come to know Christ. The only answer to everything is to introduce somebody into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it there's our energy and our focus. How do we do that? Through love and compassion. Somebody once, um, and often, often mentions, how could all of the Israelites, let's say it's a million, how could they all turn in 40 days (laughs) after everything they've been through, right? I mean, everything they saw. Moses is gone for 40 days, and they turned. It's actually very easy because there's no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament's a different game. Old Testament, Holy Spirit came upon somebody for temporary periods of time. Holy Spirit was upon Moses. Moses is up on the mountain. That's why they turn. Why is it a church like this could go through, you guys could go through years of struggle and yet still be a solid congregation. They couldn't go 40 days. The difference? Holy Spirit is within you. It's the same thing for us today. If we want to see anything change in America today with morality, there is only one way to do it, and it's not a petition, although I'm for a petition. If it can slow something down, yeah, why not? There's only one way to change any of that, and that is to introduce people to a relationship with Jesus Christ, and now they're alive. And until then, we want to love on them and show compassion to them. Because we have a second, I'll give you an illustration on, this would be a side, how about a quick theological lesson? Are we game for one? That was awesome. I heard a couple, eh. <laughs> Since you're asking, no, not particularly. That's awesome. So here's a, here's a quick theological uh, lesson on uh, the unchangeableness, the immutability of God. How many, uh, how many of you are cat lovers? So be proud. Okay. How many of you are dog lovers? See, I knew that you outweighed that. That's good. Good for you. Okay, theoretically, let's just say theoretically you were to hold a cat and pet it. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but let's just say, <laughs> let's just go out on a limb and say that somebody wants to do that. And so, uh, uh, let's say kitten, because they're all cute. We all love kittens. Uh, so, you're, you're holding a cat, and it's so sweet, and so you're petting the cat. So, God is unchanging. But he's not a force. A force is impersonal. He is a personality, and he is unchanging. And so you take this cat, and you're petting the cat. And the cat, if it were to move the other way, just swing around, and you have that same motion, So that is like exactly what happened with, um, uh, with Nineveh. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. And all of a sudden, he's not. Well, because the cat turned the other way. That's why. His movement is saying, okay, at the rate that we're going right now, you are so squarely against me, you can only last this so much longer. You're going to be destroyed. And if there's change, so it's speaking as if God has changed, but did God change? 
That's the debate. Can he change his action without changing character? Yeah, that's up for debate. But his debate was with Moses. And Moses was being brought into line here, and he showed his anger to Moses to say, okay, all things being equal, at the rate that we're going, they're all destroyed. Because they have gone completely against me. It's like taking a flat rock in, um, in a stream. If you hold the flat rock, the water pounds it. But if you turn it sideways, the water flows around it. What's well, what you do every day? We wake up and we read our Bible and we say, God, this day is yours and I want to live in a way that's pleasing to you. We're aligning ourselves with Him and His wishes. And if we choose during the day to go against His ways, there will be consequence to that. Varying based on what it is and how long it lasts, that flat rock may last a while that way. It's going to feel the pounding but eventually it might even break. Still leaves the, the amazement that Moses stood up and said, no, don't do it. We can salvage them. Who is there in your life that you can stand up for because they cannot stand up for themselves. Because they're a jerk. They are. I mean, you say one thing, it's always opposite. You're like, they drive me crazy. Could be family. It definitely is in politics. Could you imagine if our first response when we hear the name Barbara Boxer, Nancy Pelosi, could you imagine if the church gathered to pray for them in protection of them and that they specifically, that they would be enlightened with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That'd be great. Still going to vote against everything they say. Right? There's still a petition against them. It's politics. It's all fair game. But somehow, who knows what could happen? We have a president. I don't know, less than America, uh, less than half of America like him. The polls are definitely showing us that. But if there's a group of people that want to pray for his health and his mental acuity to the point where he could be open to the enlightenment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, man. Is that a game changer? Oh, but that's impossible. Yeah, yeah, that's crazier things than that. End with this thought, and I was just looking online. There was a special council member to the president that was referred to as, quote, hard man, evil genius, ev in an evil administration. The special counsel member to the president, there was actual audio, you can get it, where recommending at the highest levels of government, recommending to lead firebombing of a nine-story building, not caring about casualties, so they can get in and steal documents. There's this guy. This guy's leading revolts. Well, the Kent State. It's Charles Colson. It's the Hatchet Man. We can't forget how horrible he was. These are just things that he was caught doing. This guy was horrible. And during the trials of Watergate, somebody handed him a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. He goes into prison. He comes out a believer who sets up 
to this date still the largest prison ministry the world has ever known for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that fantastic? Somebody didn't give up on that guy. If there was anyone who was out of reach, it was him. he was horrible. Want a biblical example? Who is it in the New Testament? The Apostle Paul. He was horrible. Literally standing while believers were being killed. That was the Apostle Paul. Somebody didn't give up on him. Somebody stood up and said, no, 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 this guy. You imagine all that energy for the cause. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is, there is no enlightenment. There is no ability even to be loving and compassionate. We do it selfishly. We always will. Unless we have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, and then we can love indiscriminately. We can just love everybody. And if there's somebody in your life right now that that needs to be applied to, it's not saying I'm going to stop being angry at them. No, they hurt you. That, that hurt. That's always going to hurt. But is that a person possibly that you could be the one to provide undeserving intervention as a church in our community to stand for love and compassion, stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves or will not stand up for themselves? That's a prayer for myself. I want to ever be increasing that way. Some of you are great examples of this. We want to follow after you on that. And let's turn it over to the Lord right now. As we bow our heads, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? It starts there. Is there somebody you're kind of angry at? It could be a political figure. It could be a family member. You have good reason. I want you to know we support you on that. You have good reason because they hurt you. But my prayer is that we maybe could turn that corner. And Heavenly Father, we're asking you right now that we could turn that corner. For somebody that is, that has been very difficult with us, we want to stand up and say, would you not show your wrath? Would you reveal your son Jesus Christ to them in ways in which they could be alive? And we turn this completely over to you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.